Bonjour and welcome back to the history of the United States since 1877. On the program today, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. I want you to tell all. There is a lot of material on our plate, so I divided this lecture into three parts. First, we will look at the history of racism that afflicted the black community in the South up until the 1950s. Second, we will move on to the attempt to obtain integration into American society under Martin Luther King in the late 50s and early 60s. Finally, we will look at the more radical separatist movement of the late 1960s. We also have a separate lecture on people who opposed desegregation, specifically George Corley Wallace, the governor of Alabama. And if you were wondering who was singing Go Down Moses, this was Big Mama Sorton. So let's start with the problem. In the antebellum era, meaning before the Civil War in the 19th century, black Americans would suffer in two ways. Many of them were enslaved and thus denying their very existence as a human being, that they would be property, and only three-fifths of the person just for census purposes. But even people that were free or claimed to be free would be subjected to unequal rules. A key example in that regard would be the infamous Dred Scott decision of 1857, one of the worst Supreme Court decisions of all time. It ruled that the person in the case, Dred Scott, could not sue, uh, not because of the merits of the case, but because of the black American, he was not a proper US citizen. And so that was a way to deny the fact that black Americans, even though they were born in the United States, and in many cases had been there for many, many generations, could never be properly treated as US citizens. The situation improved somewhat with the Civil War. For one thing, with the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery came to an end, and we can thank the US Congress and Abraham Lincoln for that. But also in the same period, which is the Civil War and the period right after that, Reconstruction, the 14th Amendment was passed, which stated very plainly that people who are born in the United States are citizens, regardless of their race. That was a lot of progress forward, uh, but in practice, the treatment of blacks after the Civil War remained rather sketchy. That is the infamous Jim Crow era. You have another terrible Supreme Court decision in the, uh, in the 19th century. This one is known as Plessy v. Ferguson, and it's a Louisiana connection. It goes back to uh, tramway lines in New Orleans that were desegregated. And so a mixed race person sued so that he could have access uh, to the, the, the cards of the tramway lines on an equal footing, and the Supreme Court ruled uh, that segregation was perfectly fine and did not violate the 14th Amendment as long as black people or mixed race people had access to the facilities uh, in a different way, maybe a different area of the tramway lines or a different school. And the key word there was separate but equal. It was legal to keep black people separated from white people as long as they had equal access to different facilities. And that's what led eventually to a segregated system, especially in the South with different schools. Or if you, even if you had the same zoo, you would have a special day where black people wouldn't have access to the zoo on that particular day. Or uh, laws banning uh, intermarriage, and that was true up until the loving decision in the 1950s, I believe. Uh, separate but equal in practice often meant uh, separate and unequal. Uh, because the schools that were intended for black people might not be quite, uh, quite as well funded as those for white people. And so that remained the norm throughout uh, the late 19th century into the 20th century, mostly in the South, but also in many other areas, where whether it's in schools or restaurants or public facilities or maybe suburban developments, our black people are keep, kept separate from whites. In many cases, are prevented from marrying across uh, the racial line. And even though black people are considered to be uh, citizens, uh, they're often prevented from voting. This could be done through outright intimidation, and uh, in the South, the KKK is quite active in the late 19th century, and then again a lot in the 20s and 30s, and you have lynching incidents uh, up until the civil rights movement and beyond. Or more legal shenanigans, that you might have a grandfather clause that to be allowed to vote, your grandfather had to be allowed to vote. And so if you were the descendant of a slave, and obviously your grandpa could not vote, well, as a descendant, you cannot vote. Or you might have a test that you are asked to prove that you are smart enough to vote. And if you show up at the courthouse and you're a white person, the test might be as simple as saying, well, what is the name of the president right now? And if you're a black person trying to, uh, to vote, you might have to name every single county in Alabama and the capital of every county or some impossible to pass a test just uh, to have an excuse to uh, restrict the, the right to white people. 
or you may have to pay a poll tax, meaning that to be allowed to vote, you have to pay a certain amount of taxes, uh, which in that case would be a more blunt instrument because it would prevent all poor people, white and black, from voting. But since black people were disproportionately uh, poorer than whites, that was a way to hit them uh, harder. So that's kind of the problem. And the question after that, if you are a civil rights activist from the late 19th century forward, how do you respond to that? And I tend to make a distinction between two major axes in the struggle for equality. Uh, the people I call the integrationists and those that I call the separatists. Let me explain what I mean by that. Integration means that you want to be accepted into American society as an equal to all whites. Uh, you want to be able to, to vote, to serve in juries, uh, to serve in the army, and be, well, just like any other person, uh, except for the color of the skin. And usually people who are integrationists want to be accepted into American society, try to do that through nonviolent means, such as the lawsuits or the vote or peaceful demonstrations. Uh, separatists tend to be a bit more pessimistic. They don't think that they will ever be able to overcome racism. So their goal is more to create a distinct society or even to leave the country altogether. And they tend to be a bit more violent or impatient in their uh, agenda. And so they're more willing to resort to a violent rhetoric or even violent actions in some cases. So let's go through a series of uh, African-American leaders from the past 100 years and see where they stand. Uh, a key figure around the period of the Civil War would be Frederick Douglass who was an escaped slave from Maryland, a bit like Harriet Tubman, another key figure from that period. And after that, tried to obtain freedom for fellow slaves in part through propaganda and moral suasion. He had a newspaper, a North Star, he also was a great orator, and he spoke a lot against slavery. And he tried to work from within uh, existed, existing political institutions, specifically the Republican Party, which remember back then was a party of Lincoln, and that's a party that you join as a black person if you want to fight slavery and get racial equality. And after the Civil War, he actually served in the federal government. In his private life, he also wanted to be integrated into white society to the point where his first wife had been black, but his second was white. So based on his actions and his agenda, you can tell that he is an integrationist. Another person that would fit in the same category would be Booker T. Washington, who lived about 20 years later, roughly around 1900. At that point, he would face a lot of violence. This is a period of Jim Crow where many black people are prevented by lynch mobs or intimidation from enjoying the rights that were bestowed upon them by the 14th Amendment. His response was not to fight back. He thought that black people were a minority even in the South, and so if they fought back, um, they would eventually face uh, annihilation. So it was better to prove all the races wrong by going to school, improving yourself, and if you had enough black doctors and lawyers around, then the racists would have to admit that black people ought to be equal to whites. So clearly uh, an effort to be integrated into American society and to do it by nonviolent means. Fast forward another 20 years or so, and a key figure in the 1920s was a man called Marcus Garvey, who initially was from Jamaica. He was far more pessimistic about Americans' uh, willingness to embrace black people. And so his solution was just to break away uh, from uh, black, uh, white America altogether, and specifically to emigrate uh, either to the Caribbean where he was from or to Africa altogether, the land of the ancestors. And he actually set up a, a line, a shipping line, uh, and collected money in order to help Americans uh, just leave from the US if they were black because there would never be a future there. So in his case, very clearly a separatist since he wanted to leave from the United States altogether. The whole history of moving to the Caribbean or to Africa has a long history in African-American history going all the way back to the American Revolution. People like Thomas Jefferson had first floated that idea, and there were efforts in the 19th century through the American Colonization Society to send free black Americans to Liberia. Abraham Lincoln also embraced the idea for a while. And generally, there's been quite a bit of resistance among the black population in the U.S. to embrace uh, colonization efforts like that saying, well, we belong here. We've been here since before most white Americans were. And so this is our country as well. And we'd better fight for our rights here rather than just give up and move away altogether. So colonization efforts like those of Marcus Garvey have generally been unsuccessful. Moving to the 1950s and 60s, to the people that we'll focus on will be Martin Luther King. And you all know about him. His goal is to create a society where black kids and white kids can sit together at the table of brotherhood and to achieve that, well, you make pretty speeches, you do peaceful demonstrations, you work with no, no so clearly an integrationist. And Malcolm X, that we'll talk about uh, more in, in a minute, 
uh, he was more of a separatist in the sense that he emphasized all the terrible things that were happening in American society and the fact that he was different as a descendant of slaves. He also rejected his last name as well the Christian face which he saw as legacies of the slavery era and he famously warned that if the government was not willing to give black people the ballot soon well you might have to employ the bullet. So clearly more typical of the separatist angrier more active face of the late 1960s. When you move to the 1980s and 90s the two leading figures would be Jesse Jackson who tried to work from within the Democratic Party to run for president. He felt himself to be the descendant of uh, Martin Luther King, and he set up what he called the Rainbow Coalition, the desire to have people of all shades of uh, color skin uh, to merge together in a beautiful rainbow to have a more harmonious uh, U.S. society. And again, working from within the Democratic Party, so more of an integrationist. Louis Farrakhan, by contrast, a bit like Malcolm X, uh, rejecting the Christian faith, embracing Islam as a true religion of people of African descent. And if you read his speeches or listen to them, he has a rather uh, angry rhetoric, uh, sometimes with ugly anti-Semitic overtones. I happened to be working as an intern in the House of Representatives in the fall of 95, when Louis Farrakhan organized a Million Man March, as he called it. It was quite different from the march that Martin Luther King had organized back in 63. In the first case, Martin Luther King had organized a march that was open to everybody, men, women, blacks, whites. The 95 march was specifically for black men only, whites and women were excluded, and the kind of speeches that were issued there were far, far different from I Have a Dream. So you see why a group of black American leaders in uh, two separate categories, obviously it's oversimplifying a bit, a person like Malcolm X, for example, changed quite a bit in his career. So let's start then with the period from the mid-50s to mid-60s where many black Americans in the South and beyond are faced with a massive level of racism inherited from the uh, failed reconstruction. What kind of non-violent tactics could you use against racism? Well, maybe work within the law and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, better known to us as the NAACP, which still exists, I would simply sue in court whenever they thought there was a law that was a segregationist and it would violate the Constitution. And by the 1950s, you have a Supreme Court that is liberal enough that they actually agree with a number of these lawsuits, and that leads to some uh, important changes in the law, uh, such as Brown v. Board of Education that we'll talk about in a second. A key figure in that regard was Thurgood Marshall as a lawyer and later actually became the first black member of the Supreme Court. What other nonviolent tactic could you use beyond lawsuit? Well, civil disobedience. And that's something that is inspired by uh, the campaigns of Mahatma Gandhi in India. But in a nutshell, what that means is that you refuse to fight back. When the police attack you, you don't fight back. You allow yourself to be arrested. It doesn't mean uh, going along with every unfair rule. In fact, you willingly break the law that you consider to be unfair, and that's the essence of civil disobedience. You don't break rules that are good, such as, well, no speeding on the highway. Uh, what you break are rules that are unfair, like no black and white common sitting in a restaurant. And again, if you're arrested, don't fight back. What have you achieved by being beaten up by the police and sent to prison? Well, the power of example, that you occupy the high moral ground and hopefully everything will be televised and people who are more neutral, looking at it from the outside, will think that those black people that are being beaten up just because they want to register to vote or go to a restaurant seem to be like the good guys because they are not uh, fighting back and the racist police that is uh, kind of beating them up with sticks, uh, they must be the bad guys. So it's kind of a staging a play uh, where you have the good guys against the bad guys and the rest of American public opinion uh, will be the spectators and hopefully eventually will put some pressure on the elected officials in Washington DC uh, to change the law, uh, which is exactly what happened. That was successful in India and eventually forced the British out of there. And so Martin Luther King, drawing from the example of the Mahatma Gandhi, used the same technique then in the US South. So what are some of the main battlegrounds? Well, let's start with the schools, which remember were uh, segregated under the pretense of separate but equal. A key Supreme Court decision in that regard was Brown versus Broad Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, issued in 1954, which, uh, which said that blacks and whites should be able to attend schools on an equal footing. So you see it's fairly early on in the process, 54. It took a while, however, for Brown v. Board of Education to be actually implemented on the ground due to opposition from local states, school boards, and parents. 
So in the 10 years that followed the Supreme Court decision, you have a series of battlegrounds starting in Little Rock, Arkansas, at the high school there. Uh, in this high school, nine black kids eventually integrated the school after much resistance from the local white population. And another case that was famous was the University of Mississippi, uh, where one uh, courageous student, James Meredith, managed to break the color barrier there. In both cases, you have so much local opposition that the federal government has to step in, uh, either Dwight D. Eisenhower in the first case or John F. Kennedy in the second. You have a similar battle at the University of Alabama involving the local governor, George Corley Wallace. We'll have a whole lecture about him. So by the mid-1960s, most of these battles are won, and the schools in America have been successfully integrated by law. The reality is more complicated, however. Even after the 1960s, you still have schools that are 99% black and others that are mostly white. And that just reflects the reality on the ground that there are some neighborhoods that are mostly black and other whites, and that's where the schools recruit from. And the reality gets even worse sometimes after the 1960s because some white parents move out of mixed race neighborhood just so that their kids won't go to school with a black person. This phenomenon is called white flight. How do you solve that? The one solution for it would be to take students from one district and move them to another that is called busing that was tried in the 1970s, but that became quite unpopular, especially with the white population. If you spend money buying a school in the good district and then your kids spend an hour uh, in the bus every morning to go to the uh, inner city ghetto school on the other side of town, you could see how many white parents would go berserk about that. Another big battleground would be the issue of transportation, where again you have segregation. And you're all familiar with the famous case of Rosa Parks uh, when she tried to board the bus in Montgomery, Alabama, where there was a ruling that some area of the bus would be for white patrons only, others for black patrons only. And if all the seats were taken, black patrons would have to stand up and uh, abandon their seat to a, black, uh, to a white patron, which she famously refused to do. The explanation for her actions had changed over time. Initially, she said she was just tired that day and didn't want to get up. So there was no political agenda there. But later on, she admitted that she was tired of being pushed around and she was trying to start a fight. Whatever her motives uh, were, it did lead to a major fight where the uh, totality of the population of uh, Montgomery, Alabama, uh, either blacks or white sympathizers, would refuse to board the buses and pay money into the bus system as long as it was segregated. So that's another technique of nonviolence boycott a business that is segregated. And that lasted for about a year, and eventually it put enough economic pressure on that bus company that they had to reopen as a uh, non-segregated facility where it's first come, first serve in terms of seating. So that's a great victory there. A similar battle was about interstate travel. And the buses in Montgomery, Alabama were local, but you also have those Greyhound buses that go from state to, to state. And these were segregated as well, uh, whether it's in the buses themselves or in the wait stations uh, as you change buses and such. So in 1961, there's a big effort to do the freedom rides, they were called, and that means that a number of white and black activists uh, would charter a couple buses. They started from the East Coast, and the idea was to travel throughout the South all the way to New Orleans. And wherever you stopped, you would uh, go to local waiting stations, and the black patrons would use the white bathroom, and vice versa. If nothing happened, well, that's it. You have desegregated those facilities, the law is not enforced. If, on the other hand, you got some resistance, that was more likely, well, that would put some publicity uh, on the matter and the Nike News would talk about it. So those freedom rides were infamous for the amount of violence that the riders uh, had to overcome, especially by the time they got to Alabama. Uh, a number of the demonstrators were beaten up, almost killed. One of the buses was actually set ablaze, and the riders on the second bus decided that it was safer to just call it quit and not uh, finish the journey to New Orleans, at least not by bus, because they were at fear for their lives. Anyway, the point was not to get to New Orleans, uh, it was just to uh, add some publicity to the matter. And uh, it was successful in that regard. Ultimately, these actions put enough uh, pressure on Congress uh, that Lyndon Johnson, who was very sympathetic to these calls for racial equality, managed to uh, push Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is really a landmark piece of legislation still in the books, which simply banned any kind of discrimination in public facilities, whether it's a workplace or restaurant, or buses, every facility open to the public. And that discrimination cannot happen based on race, but also based on age, or sex, uh, or religion. Do note, however, that the list did not include sexual orientation. Discriminating against gays is still common practice in the 1960s, 
But the gay rights movement is also a product of that decade. There's a famous riot in 1969 in one bar in New York City when the local police tried to close down the bar. This movement, the Stonewall Riot of 1969, is really considered to be the starting point for the gay rights movement. If you're interested in that topic, I would recommend watching the movie Milk with Sean Penn, which is not set in New York City for the most part, but it's also about the gay rights movement in San Francisco in that case. Other notable struggles for equality of the 1960s that I will not have time to cover in the class would include the campaign by Cesar Chavez for the rights of Mexican migrant workers in California and the campaign for Native American rights as well. So getting back to categories that are protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, let's say you're a woman and you ask for promotion and your boss says, no, I won't promote women because they have a history of getting pregnant. Well, that would be illegal discrimination under the Civil Rights Act and you can sue for that. Uh, what if there is a business that says, well, I'm sorry, but this is a private business. I don't like black people and I don't want ba uh, black customers in my store. Well, that is illegal now. Or what about a business uh, that wants to fire people and says, well, these people in their 60s, they're getting old, they don't work as hard as the younger ones. I'm going to get rid of everybody above the age of 50. Uh, that is ageism that is also illegal under the Civil Rights Act. So it's really a landmark piece of legislation. The last big uh, issue would be in the franchise, meaning the right to vote, where, remember, many black people are prevented from voting, and that also afflicts the number of uh, Hispanics and Navy, Native Americans as well. And so the effort there went uh, throughout Mississippi in the summer of 1964, which is an important election year, uh, to the lead a registration drive in Mississippi, uh, where either local activists or black and white activists from out of state would go from uh, county to county and kind of round up all the black population and then together they would go to the courthouse and try to register together. Uh, hopefully just by virtue of showing up all together you would put pressure on local officials to sign you up and if not well there would be publicity about that and that's the whole point. Uh, that Mississippi Freedom of Summer just like the Freedom Rise and a few other incidents uh, would be infamous for the violence uh, that it created uh, during the summer a few of the activists kind of disappeared and they eventually were found dead. Uh, you'll have other cases also of a uh, black church uh, that is bombed in Alabama with several girls who get killed. So it is a non-violent struggle for integration. It doesn't mean that there's no violence on the other side. Some people paid with their lives for the right of others uh, to vote. A famous case as well would take place in Selma, Alabama. And Alabama is really ground zero uh, for the fight against segregation. And that took place in the spring of 65. The idea there was to march across Selma, specifically the bridge there called Petters Bridge, and hopefully get some reaction from the local authorities that were quite racist, including the governor of Alabama, George Cody Wallace. And he fell right into the trap, sent the local National Guard, the police, uh, with uh, rubber hoses and dogs and water hoses, and just beat up all the demonstrators who were just trying to cross the bridge with signs in a peaceful demonstration demanding the right to vote. Uh, so that was broadcast on the nightly news and it did a lot uh, to publicize the issue uh, at the national level and actually put enough pressure on Congress that it passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, that's another key piece of legislation that stated, well, what should be obvious, which is that people in the US should be allowed to vote on an equal footing. So this banned all the shenanigans that we have seen before, the poll tax, the exams, the grandfather clause, it also set a procedure whereby uh, states that had a long history of discriminating against certain voters, like say Alabama, uh, could not do any change to their local uh, voting requirements without getting pre-clearance from the federal government. Because the way the voting system works in the US is that even for federal elections, uh, all elections are organized locally. But if you wanted to change the law for voting in that particular county in Alabama, because there had been such a long history of using local laws to bar people from voting, then you would need to get pre-clearance before the federal government before you did anything. And that really did a lot to improve the registration rate among minorities such as blacks in areas where historically they had been barred from voting. The success in fact was so great that just a few years ago the Supreme Court decided that the system was no longer needed, that we were 40-50 years away from the era of segregation, and so it was kind of discriminatory towards those particular counties and Alabama or anywhere else uh, to force them to go through pre-clearance. So the part of the Voting Rights Act that was uh, all about enforcement uh, was now struck down by the Supreme Court. And that turned out to be a terrible decision by the Supreme Court. We've seen quite a few of those today. 
because ever since then there's been a big effort, and I hate to say it, mostly from the Republican Party, uh, under fake accusations of voter fraud, which is a vanishingly rare problem nowadays, uh, to try to restrict the vote. That means maybe to make it more difficult to organize registration drives, or maybe to limit the period when people can do early voting, or maybe close some precincts, especially in minority areas, or to institute IDs so that people that are more poor and are less likely to have a car and thus a driver's license, well, they can show up at the booth and vote. Or maybe to do a purge of the rolls uh, based on the fact that there is some typographical error or the fact that you didn't vote in the last election. So you have some people that voted in the same precinct for 50 years and then just show up one day and they're told you're no longer on the rolls and by the way, where's your ID? And if you don't have one, now you can't vote. Uh, so that can be an issue. Uh, I'll give you just one recent example. Uh, in the last election, one person ran for governor of the state of Georgia and he happened to be secretary of state at the same time, meaning that he was the one organizing the very election in which he was running. And if that sounds fishy to you, well, it is. Uh, specifically, he mounted a very aggressive purging of the rolls, uh, taking out dozens of thousands of names, predominantly black voters. And as it turned out, the person he was running against was a black woman. And lo and behold, he won the election. That kind of purge would have been disallowed under the pre-clearance system. Nowadays, the only thing you can do is go to the court if you think something is fishy, and the courts will take years before they issue a ruling on the matter, and usually they don't want to go back and cancel an election that took place several years back. A similar issue that you might have heard about would concern voting rights for felons. Uh, in many states, uh, people who are in prison are prevented from voting, and even when they leave prison and normally have paid their debt to society, uh, many of them are still prevented uh, from voting. This has a tendency to hit the African-American population more because more black males are in prison than the average population. And that can amount to quite a few people in the state of Florida. I think it's roughly 10% of the voting age population uh, that was until recently prevented from voting. Uh, this system was reversed in the last election where a public referendum decided that nonviolent former felons are now welcomed back into the rules as citizens. Uh, so at the time when I'm taping this, there's an attempt to not welcome former felons until they have paid all outstanding fines. Uh, which is a way uh, to reinstate the poll tax. So the courts are tied up in that. Stay tuned for that. So it's kind of interesting or troubling uh, that 50 years after the civil rights movement, we're still kind of fighting the same battles all over again. I'm going to stop here because there's a lot to be said about what happens from the mid to late 60s, and I'll do it next time. Au revoir and goodbye. Too late.